Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, one minute at a time. In this, our fifth season, we are looking at Joe Johnston's 2011 film, Captain America, The First Avenger. I'm Andy Nelson from the True Story FM Entertainment Podcast Network. Uh, The interrogation continues for Pete. No idea what hand he's been dealt. Today, we are talking about Minute 89, which begins with Schmidt's beliefs and ends with Schmidt's plans. Back on the show, it's Lorraine Dom. Hello, Lorraine. Hello. Ah, so we we get a great little uh, minute split between the interrogation room and the hangar at the Hydra headquarters. Uh, let's wrap up this interrogation. This is this moment. I mean, in the last minute when we were talking yesterday, Phillips kind of, you know, gave his ultimatum. It's you or Schmidt. That's the hand you've been dealt. And uh, this is where Zola kind of, um, you know, retorts, I suppose you could say. And he talks about how uh, what Schmidt believes is that he walks in the footsteps of the gods and only the world will satisfy him. Um, I mean, how does this uh, this uh, final part of this interrogation scene play for you? Uh, I love how there's a great juxtaposition between like all this crazy language, like, you know, he walks in the footsteps of the gods and uh, Zola's just sort of pragmatism about it. Like he's kind of disheveled and tired and he's like, you know, yeah, the plan is kind of wackadoodle, but what you going to do about it? He's, he's got the power to carry it out. Um, And that I, it was unexpected a little bit, like, you know, usually Characters like Schmidt feel like they have an out and he almost feels resigned to like, you know, whoever going to whoever wins here, I'm not doing well. Yeah, he loses no matter what. <laughs> yeah. Although, interestingly, he doesn't. He actually gets to kind of continue his work yeah. for a while. But at this point, he certainly yeah. feels like he's lost. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, your point, it, it is an interesting one. This This concept that is brought up here about how... Um, Schmidt believes he walks in the footsteps of the gods. Only the world will satisfy him. And Philip says, you do realize that's nuts, don't you? And Zola's response, I think to your point, it's, it's, it speaks so interestingly to kind of the reality of this sort of thing and dealing with somebody who is nuts. And I suppose this is the nature of dealing with anybody who is planning anything like this. And uh, the, the idea that, you know, um, the sanity of the plan is of little consequence because he can do it. And I, I think that's something that is very striking. And it's interesting coming up at this point in the in the franchise because I feel there's so much of this same concept that revolves around Thanos much later in the franchise. This idea of like, however crazy you think Thanos' plan of of snapping half of the a population of the entirety of the universe out of existence, Uh, you know, how crazy you think that concept is. If he can do it, you know, you're screwed. And and it's a very interesting perspective. Uh, And I suppose in some ways it's, it's a, a sense of acknowledging that there is this sort of crazy out there. And that, um, in general, we don't have a lot of power to prevent it or, you know, uh, we don't have agency in our small actions will not equal up to that one large action. And I think there's an interesting perspective that we have with uh, Colonel Phillips here, especially because it is Tommy Lee Jones playing him. You know, the way that he reacts to Zola as he says he walks in the footsteps of the gods and he's just like, huh. Like, like, uh, that's, that's a new one on me. Like the way that he reacts, uh, like it, it strikes me as he's not a person who believes that a person like this exists really. Right. It's, it's almost like he takes what Zola is saying and processes it in a way where it's like, it's crazy. No one is actually going to be able to do anything like that. And it's, it's. You, you know, you're nuts for believing it. He's nuts for thinking he can pull it off. Like all of it strikes me as, 
you know, he's still in a place where, you know, I mean, he's more closed off to the realities of what can happen. And perhaps it's because he hasn't been out in the field and seen what the Tesseract energy can do. I, I would assume at this point that he's seen, you know, Howard Stark doing some tests on it. So he has a sense of it. But I mean, we never see it in the film. This is just this person who needs to see it to believe it kind of, you know. Right. And I think it sort of um, just kind of plays into real world, too. Like, I mean, a lot of American troops were kind of shocked by what they saw in Europe and Japan, um, just, you know, because we hadn't experienced a dictator with that sort of power before. And we haven't experienced the sort of mass weapons that came about in World War II. Um, and even as far as the movie universe, I mean, they really haven't had supervillains or, you know, aliens or anything attack yet. Thor hadn't showed up. So to them, that sort of thinking was beyond what could be thought where now we're just like, Oh yeah, there's a supervillain and he wants to snap half of the population out or this supervillain wants to crash the moon into the sun or something, you know, like it's a possibility for us where it wasn't for this man. And your connection to the realities of world war two, I think is a, a strong one because obviously that's something that they probably thought about the fact that this takes place during world war two, when you had, a, a world leader, uh, you know, Adolf Hitler was running a country and here he is putting a plan in place where he is imprisoning a huge portion of the population and then doing atrocious things to them. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't want to, again, like, you know, a few minutes ago, I don't want to go too deep down these dark uh, holes of reality because they certainly exist. And, you know, I, I think... The vast majority of the population has, you know, is already familiar with all of this stuff. But I think there is an element to this sense of America coming into World War II and helping the Allies fight. And yeah, they hadn't necessarily ended up going to these these camps that the Nazis had established and seeing exactly what they had been doing. And so the idea of a person being nuts, like Adolf Hitler, putting these plans in place, yeah, you know, we've heard crazy people with plans before, too, but it's not until you see the realities of what that is and you see the bodies and everything that you realize, holy cow, I just didn't even, like, that. Ha my brain hadn't even been able to get to that place before. And now it's just, the, the horrors are so much worse. Yeah, exactly. You can't comprehend evil like that until you kind of see it and and i mean and we forget to i mean we'll assume that colonel chester phillips was what 50 years old in this movie somewhere around there so he was probably born in 1890 you know <laughs> like i mean that's that is a very different world from what he was born into into the war he was fighting and like I mean, we talk about technology progressing now. Well, that was a huge technology leap as well. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, I'm just looking. Tommy Lee Jones um, was 65 at the time he made the film. But yeah, I mean, if he was in 1945, that would put him as, as being born in 1880. So that's an interesting <laughs> point with his uh, character. If I mean, if he's, uh, you know, if his age lines up, but certainly it's... Uh, it's, that's a lot of stuff that he would have seen in his lifetime, the First World War and everything. So, Right. And, I mean, gosh, that World War II would have not been possible in 1890, let's say, you know, just from a techno technological standpoint. So, right, you know, like he has to catch up with not only evil, but with technology and how they're working together and, and where Zola lived it for the past probably 15 years. Right, right, right. Um, all of this is to say, you know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting that Zola is painting this, this worldview that Schmidt has about his plan. And Phillips isn't completely buying into it. Like, he's just like, wow, okay, well, he sounds crazy to me. Like, that's kind of the way that Tommy Lee Jones is playing. It's like, yeah, and uh, you do realize that's nuts, don't you? Like, he's saying all these things, and it's sounding very much like, yep, he's the loon, and we got to stop him. But it's not until Phillips asks him what's his target 
And it, I, I think that like he still hasn't seen the scope. And I, I think that's this is where it really hits. And I, I like the way that this plays because you have this moment of this person's like, all right, yeah, sure. What's he going to do? And he's saying like, what's his target? And Zola, like he is still like, in disbelief that Phillips hasn't clicked yet because his response, his target is everywhere. Like he literally is taking over the world. Are you not hearing what I'm saying? He's going to take down everything. Yeah. And it's a, it's a great response. It's a great performance by uh, Toby Jones and Tommy Lee Jones, because the way that he just like, that's the thing that finally stops him in his tracks, right? Mm -hmm. Taking him for more than a cartoon villainy, like, if he can't have the world, he's going to burn it down. And, uh, you know, either way the world loses. And I think that's when, yeah, that's when, that's when it sort of clicks for like Tommy and for everyone that this guy, if he isn't stopped, he will, you know, he'll either take over or blow it all up. Yeah. That's pretty much where we are as a Colonel, like, you know, his focus is, you know, you win and then you're done where like, there's never going to be a winning for uh, someone with the mind Schmidt set of Schmidt. Um, it's either, you know, there's always going to be that next enemy to weed out. Uh, right. Because if once he succeeds in taking over the world, then it becomes like, who is not, who's not, who's with me, who's against me get rid of who's against me. And then it's like, who's with me, but who's really with me? You know, I'm going to start weeding some people out internally. And and that's, yeah, it it just, it never ends. And yeah, yeah. it always needs an enemy. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. right, right. Uh, But that's the end of the interrogation. You know, Zola has kind of finally gotten through to Phillips and stopped him in his tracks. Uh, So, you know, he's finally realized the realities of the situation with, uh, with Red Skull here. Uh, any last thoughts on the interrogation that we've been talking about over the last few minutes? I sort of wonder if this was sort of the journey that Zola went through while he was working with um, Schmidt, too. Like, you know, I mean, obviously, you have that realization one day that a coworker isn't maybe... <laughs> maybe the, you know, might have some social skills that need a little boostering and then like you know like and then he's slowly like he's slowly building up ways to kind of handle uh schmidt's unbalanced and then he realized that there's no handling it there's only staying out of the strike zone yeah, um yeah. and that's kind of what he's trying to convey to uh colonel phillips but on a worldwide scale well, and it's interesting because I, I think so much of that really speaks to the train ride and what were the intentions with the train ride? You know, if he was really like trying to avoid Red Skull's strike zone, we already had Red Skull blow up at him at the Greek, uh, the the rubble in the Greek uh, hydro factory. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and so now we're in this place where Zola's like, he's blaming me for everything. I'm not even responsible for this stuff. He wants me to stop Captain America and his team. Okay, so I'm going to set this situation up on this train where I can potentially stop Captain America. But also, maybe I'm not actually going to be able to stop Captain America and I'm going to get caught and and find my way out. Like, I I, I start playing through my head like, how deep is kind of the plotting that uh, Zola is doing through this in the hopes of actually getting away from, uh, you know, from Red Skull? I love that theory. That is a great idea. Um, the only thing that can protect you from your ally is your enemy type thing, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing because, yeah, I, I feel like, I mean, Again, we see the two Hydra troopers who go into the the train car to stop to fight Bucky. And we see like the super trooper who's got the double cannons who's blasting it at Steve. And we've got a guy up in the front with Zola. But that seems to be it. So it's like he's setting this train ride up to stop Steve. But at the same time, it just it starts feeling like he's really not because 
if he was trying to stop Steve, there would be a lot more of these double double cannon wielding guys on the train or something, right, you know? Right. Yeah. Or like they would be at night or, you know, like, yeah. Something, something. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. And that moves us to our next location as we now end up in the, um, we're not exactly sure where this is. This is the mysterious uh, Hydra base that has not yet been discovered by the allies. This is the, uh, the hangar for the Valkyrie. And we come in on the front of this enormous, enormous, enormous um, plane, which, you know, we have not seen. We've heard them talking about it before. And obviously we've seen kind of bits and pieces of it as frozen in the ice at the very, very beginning of the film as they're kind of walking around on the interior. And we see them kind of uh, we see a, a, the tip of the wing sticking up out of the ice. So we've got little bits and pieces of it that we've glimpsed, but we've never really seen it. And we know they're building parts for it. But now we're finally getting the view of the Valkyrie. We come into this shot in the hangar. We're right on the front of it. And we see this massive panel of windows. You know, it's like, uh, you know, 10 windows across and uh, 10 windows high, something like that. It's it's just an insane Num- amount of windowing in the front with massive uh, engines, huge wheels that, you know, I mean, we've all seen kind of the the plane wheel. These are plane wheels that you get on those like construction trucks that are taller than a person because next to it, as we come down, we see a group of eight. Uh, these are the, the pilots um, in what look like gimp outfits <laughs> and, <laughs> and you have uh, Red Skull walk up to them and you know, the tallest of them is maybe almost two thirds the height of one of these wheels for this for this plane. So we're going to talk. Let's talk about the Valkyrie a little bit before we jump into our conversation about Red Skull and these troops. Um, first of all, what do you think of the way that this this giant plane looks? Do you like the design of it? I liked the whole design of the whole set. Um, It's very Art Deco and 30s. And I was kind of curious why uh, they went with that angle. Um, Like, because it looks very futurist, but yet it's even historical for the movie. Um, But the fact that it's like, it's, it's beautiful in its own terrifying way, but the plane is also very, like, it's just riveted steel. (laughs) Like it's very basic. There's, I mean, for it being this big, huge, miraculous thing, it's also like no whistles and bells. Yeah, right. No, it's very, very kind of, uh, dull looking, but the the, prototype. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And the design, I mean, it's very much patterned after a very specific uh, German uh, plane, the Intercontinental Bomber, that had been proposed by the Horton brothers. It was called the Horton H. Dot X V I I I or uh, eighteen. They had never built this, but um, they had built some prototypes of much smaller ones. Um, the idea is it would have had enough fuel for transatlantic fight flights, and you know would be a, a big bomber that they could zip across the ocean and bomb America. And literally, it is what looks like one of these flying wing sorts of planes. Now, interestingly, the the Horton plane that they had been designing, I, I don't believe uh, would have been nearly this long. Like the wingspan on the one that they had been designing was 40 feet, or sorry, 40 meters or 131 feet in wingspan. This plane that they designed for the film, the, this Hydra bomber, it's uh, 540 foot wingspan, 540 oh. feet, which that's a lot of fuel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot of fuel. It's also <laughs> like the biggest plane out there. I mean, you know, we've we've got the the um, Spruce Goose uh, or the H four Hercules that, of course. Um, uh, Hughes had invented back in the, uh, oh gosh, when was that? In the 40, it was around this time. It was actually 1947. Um, uh, you know, he had come up with this particular plane and uh, trying to design something. He built it out of um, balsa wood, I believe. It was it was a very light 
for the size, very light aircraft. It was very strong still. It was like I, there was a restriction with um, aluminum and all this sort of stuff. So, um, so Howard Hughes built this plane. It had its one flight, and that was it. It never really kind of did anything. Uh, but this plane was huge. The length of it was 218 feet. The wingspan, 320 feet. So that's, you know, that's... <laughs> That is a reality, but it was also very difficult to fly. This is this vehicle that, you know, according to Marvel, they've decided it's 540 feet. It's crazy. Crazy how big (laughs) they decided to make this thing. Like, it just boggles my mind. Was it cargo space for extra bombs? Or what was the... I mean, we like villains having big, oversized weapons. We like that. It It was a great visual and things like that, but it seems like... Why would Schmidt want a plane that big? Yeah, it except because it's Schmidt and, you know, his Uber tank. Yeah. We've already seen he wants everything bigger, bigger, bigger. But why? Like, what's the benefit of having a plane that's 540 feet uh, wide? Uh, on this plane, we don't see the back of it right now, but we will eventually see that there are a whole bunch of additional propellers along the back. Those propellers, as we learn later in the film, are not even needed for the plane to fly. Those are basically the smaller bomber planes that we'll we'll see, and they're you know they're just kind of attached to the mothership, and they actually um, it's it's almost like this thing is this aircraft carrier, and those things just drop out of it. So it's I mean it's a very interesting design. And I mean, it's very ominous, but it's, yeah, it's like, why does it need to be so big? I don't, I don't know if I ever what, really have any yeah, sense of that. What is gained by the size that is not lost by all the extra just to keep it flying? Exactly. Um, it is the Hydrobomber, but of course, it is also called the Valkyrie, which they've called out in the film. In the Art of Captain America book, they also reveal that it's called the Schwartz Vitva, which we talked about back in the beginning. And of course, that translates to the Black Widow, which is very interesting that this also has that name. Uh, that I mean, basically, this this Hydrobomber, the, the monikers it goes by are both other superheroes, mm-hmm. essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say two of their female yeah. <laughs> heroes. <laughs> it's, it is very funny. Yeah, it was nicknamed Pepper Potts. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I do actually like that the, it, it, they call it the Valkyrie because I think you know for Schmidt, who has had this draw to um, the myth from Asgard, and you know he's in the in his search for the Tesseract. I think he really a, a kind of drew a lot of his own motivations and decisions and things by paying attention to Odin and the Asgard warriors and all this sort of stuff. And, and he seemed to really be studying them. And so the fact that he calls it the Valkyrie, which is, you know, the strong warriors um, in that we, we finally first meet in Thor Ragnarok. um, I I think that that's very interesting that, um, that he chose to name it that. Yeah. It sort of gives it a Wagner, (laughs) kind of opera-esque yeah, uh, right. flavor to it. Too. Very much, very much so. The other note I had about the the Valkyrie as we kind of come down from it and see its tire, I will say the CG looks pretty CG here. And, um, you know, it was 11 years ago at the time of the recording. So I can't fault them too much for for not quite making it look as realistic as possible. And also... You know, there's been so much talk about the um, the battle between the people who are doing all the um, effects work in films and the budgets and how they're all overworked to deliver all this stuff. So I, I can't fault. I have a hard time these days faulting effects too much, knowing how hard it is working in the effects industry. But it still is worth calling out that, you know, I, I, I wish that this had been a model and they had done some model work instead of a CG thing. You can always kind of tell where real stops and CGI starts, and it 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 breaks you from the the moment sometimes if it's right there in front of you. Exactly, exactly. Uh, all right, well, let's talk about the pilots and Red Skull. So at this point, we have we can see the little you know the figures of the eight pilots standing down by the wheel, and then we cut to them in a closer shot um, as the camera kind of comes around the wheel and we see Red Skull walking toward them to talk. He's got a little table set up there um, with, I think it's very funny. 
There's a bottle of what looks like red wine with a Hydra label on it. So Hydra, in addition to making Tesseract stuff, is also, um, they have their own vintner who is producing yeah. Hydra brand wine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and it looks like a bottle of red, but next to it is a glass that already looks like it has white wine in it. <laughs> and I'm not exactly sure <laughs> what the process was there to bring. Here's the bottle of red, but we're going to give you some white to start with. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't understand what's going on there. <laughs> well, you know, the... The homeland makes mostly white, so that's cheaper. <laughs> so you start with that, and then you can, uh, you know, hit some red later on is, to finish up. Is that what it is? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. It it makes me laugh yeah. that. Uh, well, and I like that there's just one glass, too. He's not sharing it. Yeah, right. It's just for him. So is he yeah. going to then drink the rest of this bottle, too? Like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, It's hard to get a hold of in the war, too. <laughs> yeah, right. It is an interesting question, though. Like, is like how we know that the, the super soldier serum um, wasn't complete when Schmidt uh, injected himself with uh, with Erskine's formula. And so and we don't know if that led to the Red Skull thing or if that was the, you know, the bad becomes worse part of the formula where, you know, his evil nature turned him into the Red Skull. But it does make me wonder if he is like Steve in the fact that he cannot get drunk. And I think that's just it's an interesting <laughs> comparison because we have him here. And then in tomorrow's minute, we're actually going to talk about Steve and alcohol and here he is here. And I wonder if he has that extra wine there because he's just he, like Steve. He's just like, how much of this damn stuff do I have to drink to <laughs> even get a little he bit needs of a glass? The, yeah. Maybe like that glass is, uh, it's something stronger. So, you know, it's a little <laughs> moonshine and then the wine. It's, right. Because you know, he's a connoisseur. So he <laughs> enjoys the wine just for the taste. There we go. There we go. And also, like, if it's a Hydra brand wine, like, how old is it? it you know, two, three years at best? Well, we know Hydra has been around since the, I think it was 1938 when they were established. And before that, there they kind of spun off of um, the group that was following Hive. So they're, I mean, they didn't necessarily have the same logo, but still, it does make, it, it could be maybe, maybe eight years old, seven years old, somewhere okay. in there. That's, All right. So a decent vintage. Yeah, then. Okay. Yeah. It's not super old, but still something. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll assume they had their best vintners on it. I would think so. I would think so. Um, I, I do like that there's this moment as he walks up to the men here. He walks past the men and he is looking past the camera. And I, I, you know, we'll find out why in tomorrow's minute, but I do like the way that that's set up. It's like, what is Red Skull looking at? There's something behind us, the audience, as the camera watching him. He's kind of scanning something. And I think it's a very interesting setup that, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I like the way that it's, it's gearing us up for something more that we're not going to find out here in the minute, you know, because then when we cut to the reverse shot, we are in this low angle looking up at him as he be begins his speech here. I, I like the way that this sets us up for something like there's some mystery here of something behind us. It's writing 101 to give the audience questions, but no answers. So and and uh, filmmaking 101, too, because when we cut to this shot of of, uh, of Schmidt or Red Skull, I guess we'll just call him here. As he now turns to address the the eight pilots, um, we are now dropping the camera into this really low angle, and it's going to very slowly kind of truck forward and a little bit up toward him. And this is in in the language of cinema when you have a camera below a character like this, it is very much putting that character into a power position. You know, they are towering over us as the audience. And um, it, I mean, it's, it is used very frequently in film. If you look at stuff like Patton, and this brings me back to the way that Patton was put together, because you have a lot of shots of General Patton doing his speeches with the camera low below him looking up, and it puts him into this incredible power position as it feels like he's kind of towering over us and we're in a submission, a submissive position as the listeners. Yeah. And uh, it's a great way to kind of set this moment up with, uh, with Red Skull here as he talks about his plan and how things are kicking off tomorrow, how Hydra is going to stand master of the world 
Born to victory on the wings of the Valkyrie, our enemies' weapons will be powerless against us. That's a great little moment. In the scope of villain speeches, I suppose. Yeah. And it I, um, sort of, I think, kind of corrects for what happened in the previous scene where he was sort of diminished and like even Zola saying, yeah, he's he's wackadoodle um here you know you you believe him just from the way he's glowering and all the equipment surrounding him and there's just something so scary about lines of soldiers in masks and like it's just a i mean it's a very i don't want to say violent but maybe violent precursor um scene like you just feel like these people are ready to just go out and annihilate things yeah, you know, you you feel uncomfortable. You can sense that that violence that is um the the impending danger, you know, coming from this. Right. And and this is the moment where I mean we had as you said in the last or I suppose earlier in this minute where Zola is saying, you know, he believes he walks in the footsteps of the gods, only the world will satisfy him. This is that moment where you see you know, and then, well, then they have that moment about the, you know, being crazy. Phillips calls him nuts, and and he says it doesn't matter. Here you see a person who is fully committed in his convictions, mm -hmm. making it happen. And this is exactly what you see. You know, this is that thing where the sanity is of little consequence. He can do it now. He's going to, and we're watching him. He's talking to his troops. They're getting ready to fly this five hundred forty foot plane to do something to destroy the world. I mean. You know, I I buy it. Yeah, definitely. A, if he doesn't succeed, he's going to die trying type thing. And, uh, you know, who knows what damage he will do, even if he doesn't do the ultimate damage. What do you think of um, Hugo Weaving and Red Skull as portrayed here in the film? I thought he was a great Red Skull. I mean, I'm a Hugo Weaving fan to begin with. He's very much somebody who uh, loses himself in a character. He has so many like iconic characters um, that you, you think of more as the character rather than him. Like for me, Tom Cruise is always somebody who is Tom Cruise in a movie, but Hugo Weaving is one who loses. And I think, I mean, he played a very in unhinged character in a very sane way i think like like if you met this character i mean obviously the red skull and stuff would give you pause and you'd be like what am i dealing with here but you i think you would be like zola where you would get his crazy in waves rather than in just how there's some people where you meet them and you cross the street like you wouldn't necessarily cross the street the first time with this guy he would after a while you'd know who he was and you would avoid him yeah i love the way that you say that because i think the way that hugo weaving plays the character you find him pretty terrifying whether he's wearing his human hugo weaving mask or the red skull like earlier in the film before he takes that mask off he was still pretty damn scary <laughs> yes but but it wasn't like a unhinged scary like it takes you a while to realize just how deeply inflicted he is like yeah you would never just like from a first meeting especially if he was trying to be charming or trying to woo you for some reason you wouldn't necessarily get it but there would be a point where you would realize it and then you would just do whatever you could to avoid him yeah right right yeah he never turns into like even once he takes his mask off he's always kind of that that intense quiet villain as opposed to because you could you've seen it in other films where once that mask comes off they pretty much turn into the crazy you know rampaging uh monster that that uh, you know they now look like right but with red skull like he walks around like just this scene i mean he walks up he's very you know measured in his steps he's very kind of specific in his movements and his glances and his turns and he just has he carries an intensity that i buy into and whether he is wearing the red mask or the the human mask like he he is scary and yeah i love the way that he plays that yeah and like his uniform is still very precise and neat and correct and like it didn't take away the man it just at like 
it made the bad worse, I guess. Yeah, yeah, just like the serum did. Yeah. Do you? What are some other favorite um, Hugo weaving performances of yours? Um, I liked him in Lord of the Rings. I am not a huge fan of Peter Jackson films. I think they are uh, Thomas Kincaid esque in their glowy prettiness. Um, but uh, and but I feel like he added um, a little bit of gravity to uh, his his character and then the surrounding characters um, where they could have been a little more twee and kind of, this is our elven little world. He kind of, you know, made it seem like they have their, their things going on too. Um, Of course, Mr. Anderson in the matrix films. Yeah. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's just one of those all around good actors where when you see some, when you see he's in a movie, you know, he will be one of the best parts. Are you a fan of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert? Yes. Yes. He's, yes. he's, he's great in that one, too. <laughs> he is great in that one. Uh, everyone was great in that one, though. Yeah. That, yeah. Was, yeah. Great that was one of those movies that's it's very much of its time, but it what a time it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, that's pretty much where we're, uh, we're going to stop for today. We're at kind of at this point mid-speech with Red Skull. So we'll come back tomorrow and finish him out and see what else might happen. So uh, thank you so much for joining me again, Lorraine. Thanks for having me. And uh, everybody, remember, you can check out Marvel Movie Minute to learn more about what we're up to, to find out about our membership and find our socials, all that good stuff. So check that out. Otherwise, we'll be back tomorrow for Minute 90. Until next time, true believers. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is Spread the News by Anthony Vega, and this season's show art is by Winston Yabo. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show.